uh, let's, well, we will, we're going to talk about fixed budget. It's always, last time I gave this session it was in Prague and I was attacked by guys from Wonder Carrot, oh, Wonder Crowd. Oh, sorry. So they said, oh, no, uh, fixed budget is a piece of software. Uh, and, uh, and we only do agile, like no estimates, no fixed price, only agile. I said agile is one way. We, start, we, we continued this discussion with the, their boss over, over his blog and, and stuff. And Well, we're going to talk about estimates and fixed budget projects. From a more like estimates, like how make estimates with Drupal, that's different than Drupal, but also how, how answer to tenders and RFP because, well, you... It's rare, especially in, in south of Europe, it's rare to get agile projects. I don't know how it's the case in UK. Do you do, you do a lot of real agile or mainly fixed budget? Who does agile? Only agile projects. Two? And who does fixed budget? Well, that's, that's good. Okay, good. Yeah, maybe it's a bit wrong because we have guys coming for a fixed budget project, they, um, agile, 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 I don't know. So I'm, I'm co-founder of Adyax, and, and, and we do a lot of fixed budget projects, big projects, small projects, whatever. And um, today we're going to talk about estimates and forecasting and, and like, like see the future. Because everybody like you are, you, 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 you was already always this deadline things like it will be ready tomorrow. We know all this. Yes. It will be ready tomorrow. It never is ready tomorrow. As up soon, you, you always have these problems with um, with estimates of timing, of budget. Of course, if if you guys are late, it's probably that you lose money on the project. This is all the problem. So let, let's take a very simple example. You have a good friend of yours calling you for having a beer somewhere in Prague. I, I didn't change the slide. Sorry, I should have put London, but well, it's a four-task job. You go to the metro, you take the metro, you change to the bus, you go to the bus, that's all. But you always, even with very simple things, four task job, four task project, you have some guys that are always late. And uh, what makes uh, you late or, or make error in the estimate? Uh, you might have uh, an accident, well, kind of impressive accident uh, with, with your tram. So you have to go by, by foot. Or, or you have a strike on the metro that arrives very often in France. You know, if you go arrive in France, it's always strikes there. Um, and the problem is that, well, it's easy. Then you say, you have to predict these kind of errors in your project. You have to think about all this kind of stuff and add some security zones in your estimates and your plannings and in your quotes. But the problem is that some of the events that may make you late are, are so unpredictable um, that, that it's complicated to do it. And, uh, but let's face the simple thing that usually in Drupal project, in web project in general, there are very few errors you make. They're always the same, let's say that. The first very easy error is that you have estimates done by senior. Who does estimates? It's your pre-sales guys, it's your senior project manager, the guy who is actually facing the client, asking questions, smart questions, so you are like, look, I'm very smart, we are, we are the really good company, and they are doing the estimates. And actually, who will really do the job? It will probably be some junior guys who just hired, and he arrives, and he starts doing these views handlers with entities and services, and he, I don't know how to do it. And he spends time. So this is a very common error. What you think, you are senior guys, and you do estimates, what you think is fast, because it's really fast, actually, the guy who will do it, it might be not so fast. The second very big problem with all fixed budget is the perimeter, the scope misunderstanding. You have the client wants A, you quote it B, and actually the developer did C, and the client what he really wanted is D. So you have this big scope variations, and you try to solve it by specs, you try to solve it by uh, um, very detailed description of your work, but it's never enough. Uh, I have so many clients who have signed and validated with their blood the 400 pages specification, and after that he said, but this is absolutely not what I wanted. But you signed here. Yes, yes, I know, but I didn't understand your 400 pages of specs. So this is, this is something really usual. 
And then you have, of course, human factor. You are, you are a good developer. You're a rock star. It's like a Gabor. You have Gabor. He broke a hand and he cannot code for, for a week. So this is the errors. And what do we estimate in, in, in a Drupal website, really? Um, before we go deeply in, in details, let's, let's, let's separate websites in, in, in three complexity. Uh, so the first one is very simple website. There is no authenticated traffic. You have 10 content types. It's like a blog or, 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 I don't know, Justin Bieber website. It's very simple, nothing else. And you have this, then you have this medium size. With medium size projects, you have a little bit more content types, more templates. Uh, you have some simple XML data sources. You get some workflow and some custom business rules or whatever. And then you have this big piece of software, complex site with transactional, e-commerce, social networks, uh, with many content types, with many custom business logic and rules. And of course, you have you got these data sources arriving from everywhere. We will use these numbers later in the presentation to make calculations. So, well, this is S C sites one. It's very simple. Site three is very complex. And then we have the same on the front end level. We separate in three, two. We have the standard desktop output website, only la latest um, browser support, no JavaScript, no accessibility, very simple, like Justin Bieber. And then we have this more advanced with some GS animation carousels, a little bit. We have a separate theme for uh, iOS and Android apps. Uh, well, something OK. And then we have this big thing with full responsive design, three breakpoints. Uh, accessibility with Internet 6 support even, and we have to test this uh, responsive in iOS, Android, Windows Phone, and UC browser. I never heard it before. The client said, it, your site doesn't work in UC browser. I said, what is UC browser? It's actually, it's a browser. <laughs> um, okay, so usually when the first you take your website, you select the models, you install the models, you take a distribution, you, you, you select all your models, like a brush, nail, brush, nail, brush, you brush it. You brush it, you brush it, you brush it, <laughs> and then you have a lot of models installed. So this takes time, right? So the first thing you add in your, li in your, in your code is, is, is how much time you actually will need to install the initial, not all the models, not all the configuration, but you always have to install views, panels, Panelizer, whatever you like, or not panelizer, context, uh, display suite, whatever. So depends of the website. This is numbers we, we learned from six years of doing Drupal websites, 350 websites done so far. So, well, this might not apply to everybody, but this works for us. Um, once you've done... Is that based on one person working on the Drupal site? Uh, it's mandates. All days, I say, it's mandates. So if you, if you put two, two person, <coughs> you divide by two. Okay, so mandates. All the numbers is mandates. Important. Thank you. Um, then the second thing you have to do is you have to install the uh, development environment. You always forget that. Okay, you create a mailing list, you create Redmine or, or Track or whatever, Jira, Basecamp, whatever. You have to create users, and the client have seven of them. You have to uh, create your Git repository and ask for some platform uh, to, to install. So this also takes time. Um, then um, you have a couple of days for that, huh, I would say. And then, then you have this context. What I call context is, is everything which is related. Uh, it's all these things goes together. When, when you declare a context like, um, let's say, ho um, article page, then you have to think about the page title rules, the URL, path out rules. Maybe you have some advertisement tags uh, to add. Probably in the context, you have to add analy analytics because the SEO agency will add some very complex 70-page rules like saving on this page, I want this tag, oh, okay. Then you have to configure panels. You probably might need to add some microdata in your HTML. So this is really um, something global. You have to set up these rules, and those rules depend on the complexity of the website. So the more the site is complex, more templates you have, more time you will spend on it. Then I think there is a most important thing when you in estimate websites. I think you can even just concentrate your on, on this, the templates. Why is so important? Why templates are so important? When you do a website, actually you start with sketching, like you doing workshop with the client, drawing on the paper, 
uh, my home page, my sign up page, article page, checkout page, whatever page. Once you've done this sketching, you provide probably wireframes to validate with the client. Do you like this proportion and this wording? And then you do the design work. So you have to design all the pages. And then you do, actually we do like that, you do the static HTML, like to make sure that your nasty design works on all responsive things. And after that, you spend time doing actually templating, creating views, creating panels, applying the HTML, breaking it down in small pieces of templates. And after, if you add all the numbers on the only one template, you got these hours, like for a simple web front-end website, you have 18 hours per template, usually, on different kinds. Okay, it's, it's not the same person who's doing all these things, but at the end, you have a lot of time spent. And up to 60 hours for a free breakpoint responsive design. So you will spend a lot of time on that. More templates you have, the more time you will spend. And this is... For, for, for simple classical websites, it's the most important. Um, then, of course, you have some data migration. Probably you sign the client and they already have a website. And then uh, you have to migrate this data from the existing website. Of course, you can do it manually, but we consider that there is a lot of pages and you have to write some scripts. So you will install your migrate model and you will start working doing your mapping and, and stuff. Here it's again, it depends of the, where you take the data from. If you take from a Drupal, it's easy. Well, depends on how you build Drupal, but let's say they are used almost normal way to do Drupal. Usually you will spend one day per, per content type. So if you have 20 content types to migrate, more or less with debug, with back and forth errors in migration, you will get one day per content type. If you get from a structured database, but not Drupal, then it, make it, it might take more time. Usually you spend time on mappings. You have to take care about URLs inside the content. Uh, for example, the old website has a structure and you have inside articles, you have hard-coded URLs. It might be the case. <coughs> you have media to migrate. You have taxonomies to map. And, well, when you get uh, information from a structured database, you don't have taxonomies, probably the CMS or this, this um, type so well. And then, and then you have this, we got this one day with, um, it was a project for French government, government.fr, and there was like 8,000 pages in HTML. Uh, we did it with um, Yves Chaudemois, who is actually a core contributor, and, and we spent two months just migrate that without real perfect results, because there was everything inside, like objects, copy-paste from Word, whatever. So if you, you, you say no, <laughs> uh, or, or you say not text budget for that. Um, so once you've done all that, you are almost ready to go live. Wait, each deploy, especially if you do like kind of agile thing, like deploying is two, two, two weeks, each deploy costs you money. You have to prepare your package. And of course, all of you are doing features, strong arms, Automatic deploys. Nobody clicks in the back office, right? Okay, good. I do. Uh, so anyway, depending on the where you deploy, where is the hosting partner? If you have a Drupal Cloud, what I call Drupal Cloud, is Acquia, Pantheon, uh, Commerce Platform, whatever. It's quite easy. You prepare your features, you test that it works, and then you click and deploy. If you have access to the hosting environment, live environment, and you can install Capistrano, Jenkins, whatever, something automatic, you will spend almost one day, more or less, we, and you add QA because you write your deployment scripts, you write, you prepare your features, oh, I forgot, you have to revert it, I have to update it, whatever. You test it, you deploy, you spend one day. Maybe you spend even more. And of course, if you have this old school, big, like data pipe or whatever, you don't have access to these um, platforms, you have to send them files, I got a client there, uh, in France, from Atos, big company, no access to environment, no access to nowhere. I have to send a zip file with every time. And of course, each time they, they have two front ends because it was a big site. And they manually installed these zip files there and zip them. And of course, half of the time they forget to update one of the front end. And it's really hell because you have half of the website working in the V2 version and the, you refresh and you go to another. So, well, 
fixing a deploy on an old school environment make, might take a lot of time. Um, and then, of course, we talked about only efforts about um, development. But then you have uh, also a lot of things about testing. And usually what we apply is um, a percentage of their days. So usually you spend, we, we notice that, that QA time is re really related to developers. Okay, if you have crappy developers, they spend much more time. If you have um, crappy testers, then you spend less time, but the site is crappy. So usually you have 15% uh, for a simple website and up to 30% for a complex website. Why? Because if you have responsive, you have to test it on all, all, all browsers. If you had a lot of data coming around, you have to test also business specific case. You developed a lot of custom code. You have to, you have to test it. Management. That's 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 something. It's it's it, it takes time too. Some of the small projects, if you have very smart developers, they are auto-organized, agile team. They are like doing everything perfectly themselves. Like, whew. and that's not the case. Actually, you have to manage manage the client, manage the priorities, manage deployments, make sure that you get information from everybody, everybody is ready to test. And of course, m the more the project is bigger, the more time you will spend on management. Because, for example, we have a client, we have one project manager, and in front of him, he has 25 persons to manage from the client side. And uh, it's a big client, it's, it's, it's social security, internet for, for friends, so, you know, social security is so important to friends. So, so we spend a lot of time on, 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 on management and, and percentage of development and QA. That's we noticed also from numbers. Um, one really important thing is specs. As we do fixed budget project, and we imagine that we are in the design first um, perspective, we need to write specification. It's really important. Each project we failed at IDX, Every single project that we, we, we've got lost, lost some money it because of lack or, or bad specification we've done. So really, it's, 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 it's really important to spend some time uh, on, on, on specs. So you have usually, you have usually um, this is main things you have to specify. Of course, your content type, you start with specification of content types. Um, you will spend more or less time depending on the complexity of the website. External system, you will have to describe how your site is connected. The workflow, how, how internally the, the, the website will, will work with, with contribution. Uh, user related features, everything that is related to user. I can connect, sign up, my, my comments, my, my, my account, everything that, like that. Back office, this is something that we usually forget, but you, have, you will have to spend some time on back office specs. Uh, front end, of course, you have to describe what happens if I click on this little button here, or what happens there? Um, SEO and analytics, you have to describe how else it's connected. What are the tags here? And data migration to search, well. Um, that's all, but I think we forgot one thing. It's the features, because actually we describe everything but the features. Um, the, well, the, there is no rules, of course. It depends strongly of what you have to do. There is only your experience how to estimate features. There is no rules. Well. Um, I wanted to get back to some estimate. There is a, one good thing because before uh, doing Agile, being Wonder Car Wonder Crot, uh, they, 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 they was not one, and they, 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 they set up this matrix. It's quite widely used right now with this uncertainty factors. As you see, they do estimates actually, and they add on each line um, UF factor. And this is a quite a good idea if you can um, go to see your client and say, I will do fixed budget, but at this stage I cannot give you one number. I have rather give you a range, right? So this is kind of good. So the idea is that you estimate your each small feature like usual, and you say like, ima imagine you said five days. And then you get, well, kind of brief description of what you have to do, but you don't have all the details. And if you don't know all the details, you apply a factor of three. And uh, then you have this um, idea of um, uh, what kind of um, 
factor you have to apply to that. You have this matrix, uh, for very, very smart matrix with all the numbers here. And depending on the client, it's a cool relationship, nice client, you already work with them, you know that they are good, you apply the optimistic um, values, or if you don't know nothing about the client, or you have scared big public um, organization, you will apply pessimistic. And then, depending on the level of knowledge you have about the feature, you will apply different levels of factors, and you will get actually something between three and a half and six and a half days. And of course, the client will get back to you and say how I reduced range at the end, because the range might be really big. And then you say, okay, let's go through these um, um, estimates, and let's explain me more about each line. So this offers you an opportunity to talk with the client a little bit more, to exchange, and, and to talk a little bit more about the project, and also shows that you're kind of aware of risks. You're not going, okay, it will be 10K, no problem, I will do everything. It might scare a client, so you should have, you should better to discuss a little bit more with him making workshop stuff. So this is a way of estimate, but how we do respond to the RFPs? Because usually when you do a fixed budget, we have an RFP, and we have to answer in three days, and with everything inside. So I, I've divided the RFP in about three categories. The first one is user-centric RFPs. So this is kind of new RFPs. You have this person I, um, user stories, very nice. As a visitor of my website, I can see um, a homepage. So user-centric, uh, you have usually a very detailed uh, presentation of the features. Uh, everything is described in user stories, but the same feature from a Drupal point of view, like for example, um, um, a simple thing like publish an article, is, is spread across different user stories. You have the front end of the article in user stories from anonymous users, and you have uh, user stories from editor describing the back office part. So you have to reassemble it all in one. And you have to be very careful about templates and site structure, because usually it's not described. When you read user stories, you don't really know what, how, look, how will look your website. Then they have the opposite, the page-centric RFP. You receive these 40 pages of all the website pages, all the templates. And then they say, it's easy. We already designed everything. You have just to say how much it will cost. Be careful. It's easy to count templates, actually, because you, you have them all. But then you have to be very careful with business rules. Why this small block is here? And what happens if I click? Oh, it, you have to send a query to SAP. Oh, really? It wasn't described. So this is, you have to be careful with business rules. The final list is feature list. It's like, I want this, I want comments, I want Facebook, I want YouTube, I want Google, I want everything, and then how much it costs. This is, this is really, um, feature list is, is, is complicated because it's easy to get features, actually, but you have to imagine the entire website. You have to actually think about what could look this website. So it's, it's, it's dangerous. Uh, then we have these hidden costs. Uh, you, you always forget them adding to code, but it's important because you will er always spend time on it. You will have to clean up the back office. If you set up a standard on a big website, if you set up a standard back office of Drupal, nobody will like it. It's, it's ugly. You have a lot of things, like you have content types with 50 um, widgets inside, and if you have uh, node references, you will have to add search button, add in place, because you don't want your users to add the node and then add references to it. So a lot of small things, like you want to dashboard, and you want to have search possibility, bulk operation, many small things, but you have to think about. Uh, then the workflow is much more complicated than you think. You would think that you will install Workbench and you will get the workflow. No. You will have a lot of problems with notification, permissions. You will have to click a lot in the back office. Why is it? It's also a good, good example. When you install just TinyMC or, 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 or CK Editor, cool. But if you open it like this, you will get a lot of problem in the content contribution. You have to fix and close things, close holes, not offer possibility to add red big characters, not, uh, not give authorization for tables or whatever, because otherwise your, your website looks like nothing. 
Um, and at the end, you have to spend time with optimization and architecture fine tuning. Of course, it doesn't apply for small websites, but if you have a big website with a little bit traffic or complexity in it, you will spend time on varnish, on memcache, or tuning Apache Solar, uh, making it uh, more or less relevant. So you have to spend time. And usually we don't add that in the, in the quotes. But if you add all this stuff in your quotes, then you have the risk to be the most uh, uh, expensive. And there is no reason to prepare for a week a very good RFP and then to lose it because you are too expensive. So <coughs> the first thing you have to do is uh, to be as much precise in your code as possible. You have to describe exactly what you will do. So it will help you to understand the project, but also it will help um, the client in when, when you go, if you win the project, it will be much easier to discuss um, uh, change request and evolution. Because, for example, if you've done, okay, Drupal site, 100 days, uh, 40K, and then the project starts and the client say, look, I want this, it was in my specs. And you cannot negotiate that, like, okay, it wasn't in my course, it was Drupal website. It's the same, for example, if uh, the client wants to negotiate with you, saying it's, it's much com more complicated for you to defend your 40 days than if you have 40 lines with one day. Because it's one feature, one day, it's much easier to explain why it would take one day and not a half a day. But if you have 40 days, nobody knows. 40, 41, 35, maybe 30. That's why. Um, in case of, if, if some feature is not clear, because usually you don't have time to understand everything and spend weeks on workshops, um, usually uh, you can take the lower estimate and explain exactly what you will provide, saying, look, I will install you scheduler module, and then you will get scheduling <coughs> of nodes feature. Then if the client says, but wait, I wanted to bulk schedule, and I have a planning with a dashboard where I see all my nodes and when will we publish it, he said, look, okay, but this will be for more money. I explained you I installed only scheduler module, I did that, and it took so much time. Or you can do like big agencies or big uh, companies, you don't care about uh, the build phase and you'll think that I will get money for maintenance and, and evolutions and that, that sometimes they do, it's, not, it's very dangerous and not apply, applicable for, for small companies. So imagine you've already win your project, so you did a very good quote, you, did, you win the, the RFP, then you start the build phase. Actually, this is when you really can lose money, because before that, well, you spent some time on RFP, but now you will have developers and you pay them a lot of money. And what's it's important is to measure. If you don't measure your work, you cannot uh, actually make sure that you will not lose money. Um, so we use Redmine, we are moving to Jira right now, but it's important to have, uh, what we do is once we started the project, we have this, my initial quote, and we create one super task in Redmine or in Jira, whatever, for each line of your code. So you have your template X, you create this super task. And any single issues that will be related to this task, bugs, QA, subtasks, whatever, you attach it to this super issue. So at the end, because everybody have to log time. That's really important. Every single developer, QA, whatever, log his time. I spend this time on this task. At the end, you have a real comparison between what you initially quoted and at the end, with all the tasks and subtasks, what you really, your cost is. So this is a kind of example when we have one big task and a lot of subtasks there. Um, so, well, then you have this project backlog. Even if we don't do Agile, we still have backlogs. So we have on the left, uh, you see your quote data, it's where you put your estimates, specs, dev, PM, etc. And then actually this is your small subtask you've created in uh, actual project data. And then you ask the developer to report there. And you get then the differences between what was really spent and what you've done. So this is kind of, it seems to be something that really take a lot of time. <coughs> But this is the only way to manage uh, your costs and the only way to make sure that your uh, project will bring you some money, at least. Um, 
So everybody must lock time. If you don't lock time, you don't know if you lose money or not. Uh, you have to keep the link between what you put it initially and what you're actually doing, so you can see if you are on track. Bef at the beginning, we didn't share estimate. We did the estimate RFP thing, and then we give the work to developers, specs. And now we share the estimate with everybody. We said, look, this is what we've got it initially. Be why it's important? Because actually, who will be able to detect if you are going out of specs on a project with 12 months and 15 people? It's not the project manager. He cannot overview every single task is being done. The only guys who really see the work done is developers and QA. So they can alert the project manager saying, look, we are doing things right now that are not quoted and I cannot attach in the 20 quoted part. Or we are running out, we, we, it was five days there and we are already 15 days. So the alerts will go from button to the top. And the last thing is stick to the plan. Whatever happens, even if you are in the release, you stick to the plan. You lock time, you work with specs, whatever happens. Because if you abandon the plan, during the panic mode, you will lose much more money. And, and the client will not be happy and everything like that. So also if when you do fixed budget project, you have a lot of evolution. Because in, in, in Agile, you have sprints and you add um, items in your backlog and your sprint and it's okay. But when you're doing fixed budget, you have the initial quote and then at the end of, after six months of development, you have a lot of small evolutions. And as you <coughs> keep track of everything, you start to have like, okay, it's a half an hour evolution, two hours evolution, three hours evolution, which you will not s send to the client, uh, oh, please uh, sign me this uh, 300 euros or sign me this or 30 euros evolution. So to avoid that administrative, like what we do is keeping credit and debit stock. So we put it in a shared XLS file with everybody and we, each time the client agrees or something, we say, okay, we added half an hour here and at the end we send the total bill. Why it's good? Because then you, you don't send many bills so it's easier to manage and everybody has an overview of what, what happens on the project in terms of estimates and, 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 and money. Um, what we also introduced at the end is the stop day. At the middle of the project, in the middle of the project, we stop everything and we look at what has been done, how much work it remains and we redo estimates and we like just stop day, it's really important to make step behind, look at the project, what happens, where we are, especially on big projects. Um, the last thing, when you lose money is in the acceptance, because this is never ending acceptance during for months and months and months and you have two new bugs and then three more bugs and then you have a small evolution and then four more bugs, never ending acceptance period. When you always have that, even with Agile project, you all, at the end you have this, uh, this acceptance. So at the very beginning of the project, you have to time box the acceptance. You say, look, at the end of the project, you will have four weeks to do the acceptance. This will force your client to think, prepare his team, and to think that he has four weeks to find every single issue. It's not the truth, actually. You will not stop your project after four weeks, or you will not release a project full of bugs. But it will force the client to prepare for the acceptance. Then you have to define with the client which actually blocker issue is. That's really important. Is it no bugs, no bugs at all? Or it's acceptable to have some problems with e Internet Explorer 6? So when you define this time box and then you define the blocker issue, then you can go live even with some bugs, but your acceptance is boxed. So you can say, okay, we are gonna live, we have guarantee, we have support, whatever, but we go live at this period because we don't have any blocker issues. And also we have to, because clients are always, uh, often, very often they are scared about what happens after we go live. You disappear? No, you have to say, I have a guarantee period of three, four weeks, three months, whatever, and I will take care of your project, no problem. So he's not scared to going live. Um, and of course, we have to avoid at all costs introducing new functionality during acceptance period, especially if it's not blocking, like, oh, finally, I want a Facebook Connect. No, that will not going to work. We go live and then we add features. And finally, when you also have to talk about support and maintenance, this is something, this is something, you take time and, and, and you 
you spend a lot of time in support request. This is something very hidden. Ah, hello, how do you edit this article? Which is okay because you will not uh, hang up to your clients. You will, but if you have 100 clients, it's, it's cost you a lot of time and money. So you have to take care about this support and maintenance at the end of the project because it will take your time. And the more projects you have, the more you have project and maintenance, and the more <coughs> calls you receive, and the less projects you actually do. So thank you again. And if you have any questions or tomatoes, you can close it up. We have very fast questions here. Yes. Uh, it's about logging time. Yes. So do you have a realization that not time, real time and log time, in the sense that if someone puts in eight hours, which if they work eight hours in your company, it's not really eight hours. Yeah. Uh, well, we, well, it's quite. We, we are very, very accurate about the time logging. We ask them to to to, to log in each. It's it's not automatic. Some of them using automatic tools like Hyper okay. Timer, but it's logged time per task. So it's not eight hours. Yeah. So f um, maybe project managers do that, but for uh, for all developers, QA, they open the task, they start the counter, they work, they close, they log the time. And for example, in Jira, we have for each transition of each workflow state of the task, like to be planned, QA, developed, etc., we forced to update the estimate at each transition. So we are sure that we have this log time. But time log is so important. But do you actually allow for the fact that people live and function outside those log tasks. So the idea, if I, if I could be sitting on a task and log an hour, yeah. I'm probably not doing an hour, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, do, you, do you actually roll that into your estimate? So the idea is, mm -hmm. so it's an eight-hour day, realistically, a good developer, you're probably getting six, maybe five out of them, especially if they've got other things to do. But they will probably log eight hours against that task. Yeah, well, the usually guys uh, from the production team, they do, they dedicate it to a project. Mm -hmm. So when they work for a six months project, we don't do very small projects, but when they work on the project, they are dedicated. The only resources which, which are shared between different projects are project managers. Okay. But they are easy because they are like only one task, like to, to project management is like project management task. Mm -hmm. But yeah, developers, they, they, they log the real time. We really um, care about that, that every single minute spent. And we spend a lot of time explaining that procedure and everything is related to, well, we force guy to, to log real, real time. It's really important. It's vital for us. Uh, yeah, those. Two. How, do you log, how do you log project management? Um, well, the same way we have a project management task. Uh, it's not possible to, 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 to spread across different tasks, but we don't really care because in a big project you have much more time spent on development, QA, and HTML than on project management. So we have one task with project management for a lot of time there. Yeah? In terms of clients wanting to review what work has been done so far, what do you have to do about that? Uh, well, when you do fixed budget project, we don't have really, you, you mean review the time? Yeah, just in terms of what's kind of done there or... Ah, I mean you, how you show what you've done so far? Yeah. Well. Yeah, we have, we have I even if we don't do Agile with clients, we still do Agile internally. So we have these sprints, and we deliver each three weeks on production or pre-production or development environment. We deliver a um, kind of finished piece of work. So each three weeks, we, we have meetings, steering committees with the client. We show what has been done so far, demos, etc. So, well, yeah, we, we do fixed budget, but we split it in small parts. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, well, the, yes, the first thing you have is uh, at the beginning you have something. Then at the end you, you always have validated design, PSDs. You have functional and technical specification. Everything is described, content types, everything is described. And then you take that and you split it into small parts. And then you do the same agile thing like, okay, priorities, backlogs. I don't have time, I put it to the next sprint, etc. But yeah, well, actually you split it down in small parts. And you create in Redmine one task, okay, create me content types, please uh, set, uh, make me the article page in this print, etc. Yeah? How long does it take you to prepare a book? <laughs> <laughs> uh, good question. It depends. It may, type, it, it may take a week for a big RFP, uh, and it may take a couple of hours for a small piece of, uh, of website. It depends really of how 
what, what is the relationship with the client and, and, and what the level of details they really want and why, what are the level of confidence you have with the client. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's very easy. It's shared with the client. It's Google Doc, so it's shared with the client. And then when he asks something, we add a new line with estimate. And when, as soon as he confirmed that it's okay for him, we mark as confirmed. And everybody can look at it. And uh, as soon as it's confirmed, then we uh, add it in a sprint. We do it. But we bill at the end of the month or monthly or at the end of quarter or whatever. So it's, we, we make a sum and we remove what is already built. And okay. Oh, uh, uh, well, that's another question. What happens if actually you estimated five days and you spent four days? Yeah. It depends. Yeah. Or you, because the, the other question is what happens if you estimated five days and you spent 10 days? If the client agrees to pay you more, then you are not really in the fixed budget negotiation, so this is good. If, the cli if it is a symmetric thing, if I spend more time, you pay me, and if I spend less time, I give you back the money, then it's okay, but if it's fixed budget, it's it's based on your estimate. So if sometimes you lose, sometimes you win. It depends. Yeah, there was a question there. Uh, it doesn't matter, like, uh, this project, like, you put two hours on the, you know, the high, high cycle, but the one speed is converting the business uh, requirement into Drupal. Company. Yeah. And, and when it comes to a big project, it's really hard to explicitly ask how the global thing works. So most of the thing, like a minimum viable product is just deliver. Yeah, this is, this is quite common. The, the question is, like, what happens if the client expresses your business rule, I want a forum, and then how you convert it in, in, in real Drupal thing? Because you can take the forum, you can take, uh, do it in its content types, or you can even connect the PHP BB with some SSO, whatever. So actually, this is the step of specification. So the workshop, at initial workshop, you will discuss with the client what really feature they are. And then you have the specs. The specs are done, is for that. You describe exactly how you will do, and you will show these specs to the client. Not all of them will understand everything, but it, it, it shows the client that this is the way it will work. Of course, the, there is always discussion. The, all the client wants specifically this feature. I want these video comments with five fields, and, and I do not agree to using standard Drupal comments. Then you have to customize everything and you spend more time, or you have to, you, you can propose the model, show them, and, and the, the use of the existing model, yeah. So Sorry. your, your estimating system is quite verbose, the proposition, so it's taking two years to get there. So how accurate is it? Ah, well, today, so today, if, I would say it's very accurate. I mean, at the beginning of, uh, uh, at the beginning of Ajax, we got like 30% of project we lose money. Today we do much more projects, about 50 to 60 projects per year, and we have only one or two when we lose a little bit money, a little money. So it's very accurate, I would say. It, and of course, it depends of the if it relies on people. You always, it's not automatic. It's not robots. You have to lock time. You have to um, mm, mm, making alerts if you are out of scope. So it always you have always human factor. You cannot be perfect on that. It's not robots, so guys, you, you rely on a team of 15 person. If the clients say, it's not, a, it's not an evolution, I, won't, I don't want to pay for that, what do you say? Or you lose the client and you go to court, or you, okay, no problem. So, well, it's, the human factor is still very important, but the system is quite accurate. Uh, sorry, there was a question before. Yeah. Um, the question was, how do you estimate like, design, design work, or do you do design work? We how do a little, we do the l not so much design, but we do design. Um, but usually our design work is more we get like master templates or from big agencies like one or two and then we do all the small templates uh, like um, all the responsive all the UX so this is kind of work we used, used to do and this is a uh, well this is the same we, we didn't add that depending on the number of uh, templates depending on the complexity depending of the responsive you spend from 
two hours up to one day or two days per template. So, well, it's kind of, we have numbers too, but I didn't include them, yeah. Back and forth, yeah. And that, like, oh, well, yeah. this is that we call the. Um, we have an iterative process. We start with sketching, so the client is involved at the very beginning of the process. We draw with the client, so we make them okay. Draw me your page, and I will. And of course, the UX guy will draw it in another way. So look, you prefer this one. Then we go wireframes. He validates wireframes. Then we go to black and white design. He validates that, and then we go to the uh, color design. So the idea is we avoid at each stage, at the sketching, we are he's involved, so he's okay to do this work. At the wireframes, he agrees on uh, the content, the proportion of different items. On the black and white design, he agrees with typo, with uh, pieces of blocks, and he doesn't concentrate his attention on colors. I don't like this block, it often means I don't like green. I would prefer blue, but he doesn't express that. And when we go, we add color, and at the end, it's easier, so he has only to agree on color. So doing that, you reduce the number or, or if you present your I initial homepage, like, look, do you like this? No. Okay. And this one? Mm, no. But th I want this and this and mix of this button, but this foot footer and this header. And you spend a lot of time. So we do it like this. Yeah, this was his question. Yeah, yes. So obviously, we could be saying that your estimates are pretty spot on. What do you add when you actually are uh, being uh, asked to do an estimate on stuff you don't actually have experience in? Do you add a, do you, <coughs> do you e increase your, your factors? Yeah, usually or you increase your factors or you request a workshop. It depends on the risk. If, you have a, if I have to implement, for example, a new SSO system, mm -hmm. this is something I had to estimate Kerberos. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it will work, because I've never implemented Kerberos SSO, but I know what is SSO. So I can imagine that SSO will require like uh, token negotiation, then creating session, and maybe some calls. So I, I know it more or less. If I don't know nothing about, like integrate with this new ERP you, nobody knows about it, then you have to add uh, workshops. Or at least uh, like half a day workshop is enough to get enough es accurate estimates. And yeah. Do you use the fixed price project? Do you tend to add on any, do you, do you have a Well, it's, it's different ways to do the same thing. Or you add the contingency, and then you have to explain to the client why it's for, and how you use that, and, uh, or you simply very make, put a lot of details, and you mark explicitly the lines that are not, uh, what you are not sure about, and then uh, they do change requests. It's, well, it's the same. Uh, uh, we don't add uh, contingencies. Yeah. Well, this is this is yeah. This is a more uh, when you do estimates, it's you have to think about not how uh, how much time it would take to you to do that, but how much time it really took previous projects. This is exercise which is very complicated because you are in hurry. You do very. Okay, this five days, this four days, this one day, this two days. No. Are you really sure that it takes you five days with your team? No. Check out this project, this project, it took them seven days. Do you keep kind of like a master uh, template estimate of what the average yeah. days are across the network? We also have a lot of metrics. Uh, we have dashboards, but th those I cannot share them. But we have a lot of real time dashboards with follow up of everything, so I, I can easily get the information how much time it really took. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a question there, there, there. You have um, been asking about that point, the, the concept of a, a junior day rate and a senior day rate in SAS. Uh, sorry, I didn't, uh, can uh, <coughs> Are we on? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Are all your staff charged down at the same rate? No, no, it's, oh, yeah, we, for, for, we, I know that uh, there's a lot of senior, junior developers. We don't have, we only have only two rates, like for, for management and for developers. It's easier for us uh, because, well, who is really senior and who is junior, and, and, and if you change, you know, it's too complicated. So we have only two rates, well, normal developer and, and architect. Like, that's all, easy, simple. So, that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you.